courageous voices echoing in our lives, my mother's love. You know, without a doubt, uh, my mother has had more impact on me, not only uh, than any other woman in my life, but any other person in my life. Uh, at the age of seven, my parents uh, were divorced. There were three of us. And I saw over time my mother struggle to put us through college. We had uh, all three of us in college in three different states. And always keeping her head on the prize, if you will. And that prize was remember your family values, uh, seek education because education is the key to your uh, survival in life. And I saw those times when she struggled from paycheck to paycheck to make ends meet, where we had to uh, resort to uh, creative, what I call creative menus in order to survive. And now at this point in my life where I have uh, a lovely wife and two kids, and sometimes when I look at what I think are my individual struggles, I need only to go, go back in time and look at what my mother went through and say, hey, you don't have it that rough. Uh, she is my inspiration, and to this day, I know I can call her at any time, anywhere, at any time of the night, and say, Mom, I need help, and she's always there. Submitted for your approval, three opposite individuals lost in the abyss of depot operations suddenly thrust into the satellites. What about looking at some videos? Good idea. On. Then I'll watch you three seconds later. I got you shaking your head, dancing instead of sitting. Oh, no, 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 not rap music, not here. Goodness gracious, fellas. I bring you to work so you can watch me rehearse. And you gonna play rap music? Rap music on the way home? Rap music here at work? What is it about this rap music? Do you know, when I was a little boy, we didn't have rap music. We had Isaac Hayes, we had The Temptations, we had The Four Top. People that when they sang, you could understand what they're saying. All I hear now is rap music. What is it about this rap music? I hate this stuff, you know what I mean? Oh, you don't like it because, just because you can't do it. What do you mean I can't do it? I can do rap music. It's no big deal doing rap music. Then prove, prove it. it. Okay, I will. I'm gonna do a rap for them. I'm gonna call it the Depo Rap. I know why you're here, and I'm sure it's true. You need to know what the Depos do. Sit back, old friend. Relax if you can and listen to this rap from the depot old man. Now some depots are large and some are quite small. Some do maintenance while some do it all. The Army has depots, DLA too. But that's not important as what the depots do. We'll start with organization, something you need to know. We'll key in on those elements that make the depot go. To make all these points, we'll use charts and graphs and we'll try to mix it up with some fun and some laughs. Now this may sound tough and make you feel blue, but it's our way of teaching what the depots do. So sit back students, partners and friends, because this is where the real fun begins. You asked for it, so it's back to you. Enjoy yourself learning what the depots do. What do you think, fellas? Nah. Bucky Taylor, we're here today to talk to a former depot commander so you, the student, can get some feel for what it's like to be a commander of a depot. Sir, I think you'd have to admit that this is a pretty unique interview. Could we start first by getting your name? I'd like to give you that, BT, but that would obviously defeat my purpose for being interviewed in silhouette form, now wouldn't it? Let's just leave names out of it. That's not important. Just ask your questions so I can get back to my therapy. Therapy? Did you say therapy, Colonel? Well, what kind of therapy are you in and, and why? Look, BT, when I agreed to be interviewed, the ground rules were you were going to ask me questions about my experiences as a depot commander. I was going to give your students a feel for what it's like. I'm ready to proceed based on those ground rules. Otherwise, I'm out of here. Capiche? 
Yeah, I could pee, sir, but I think the students would still like to know. Okay, the first question I have is a general one. What's it like being a depot commander, and were you at an Army or DLA depot? BT, you can't trick me with the sneaky question routine. That's two questions, not one. I've commanded both uh, a DLA and an Army depot. I started out at one of the largest Army depots, and after I completed that tour, I managed to land an assignment at uh, a DLA depot. Isn't it rather unusual to have uh, two depot command assignments? I didn't think the, the DA assignment folks work like that. Well, for a reporter, you certainly don't listen well. I said I managed to get two command assignments, which indicates I pulled some strings to get one of them. I happen to like being a depot commander, so much so that I called in some favors so I could do it again on the DLA side. Well, what was it about depot command that, that made you want to do it twice? Well, you know, to put it bluntly, BT, it's, it's like they used to say on that show called the A-Team. Being a commander is like being on the jazz. There's a, a thrill of accomplishment, uh, a sense of adventure, a, a taste of power that, that permeates your entire being and makes you feel like there's a reason for your existence. Every day there's something different, a new challenge, a new opportunity to excel. And that was something you enjoyed twice? You betcha, bud. I got a real kick out of it. As a matter of fact, those were the two best assignments of my career, and part of the reason why I'm in therapy today. Sir, we'll get back to the therapy thing in a minute. What type of issues does a typical depot commander get involved with? Well, BT, being a depot commander is indeed rewarding because you become involved in all aspects of operations uh, of an industrial facility and city. There are issues of importance to headquarters, like productivity, congressional visits, and congressional responses. You are the main public relations person for the depot. You establish the military presence. You have military justice responsibilities. And of course, mission goals and objectives to meet. Which issues did you consider your pet issues? I consider the people issues to be of utmost importance. Things like EEO and union policies, uh, awards and recognitions, uh, VIP visits and quality of life concerns. I truly believe that if I could remove some of the barriers that restrict people from working up to their full potential, my efforts would be reflected in the, in the productivity stats. Community relations was also a very important part of the job because it's important that the community understand us and our mission and that we understand them and their concerns over things such as employment and quality of community life. I love that part of the job. So what are some of the key qualities that you think a good depot commander should have? Patience is a must, because the, the wheels of progress and change sometimes grind slowly. And as hard as you try, it sometimes takes time to see the results of your efforts. A commander should also be into fire prevention rather than firefighting. Meaning what, sir? Well, meaning if you do a good job of establishing good, solid processes and procedures, then everything is not handled in a, in a crisis mode. You also have to be a politician, a diplomat, a coach, a drill sergeant, a grandfather, a big brother, a hero, a villain, and a referee. A referee? What do you mean? Well, one of the key aspects of the job is to analyze the recommendations and opinions of your subordinate managers. Filter out those littered with uh, turf protective slants and, and meisms, and call the game according to both the rules and the best interests of the depot. To me, that's the same as being a referee. Interesting perspective, Colonel. What would you consider to be the best and the worst parts of the job? Well, the best part had to be working with some of the best people in the world. Private industry has nothing over us when it comes to hardworking, creative, and dedicated people. I guess the worst part was the, the constant travel required, which prevented me from spending more time with the folks at the depot. Now, being a depot commander is a lot like being a city manager. I had all the things that any city has, population, police, fire, crime, housing, utilities, industry, you name it. 
it's tough to be a good city manager or depot commander if you're away a lot. I depended heavily on my uh, CE, my deputy, and my directors to know and do their thing. Thanks, Colonel. Hey, we're almost out of time, but before we go, you got to share with us, why the silhouette, why the therapy? Okay, BT, but don't let this out. After my second command, DA finally got me. And they assigned me to an unnamed uh, headquarters position in a major metropolitan area. Well, a good assignment, I guess, but it's just not like a depot. I started having withdrawal pains. And a closed-in feeling from not having responsibility. You know, the staff car, the luncheons, my own parking space, the award ceremonies, the VIP visits. I even miss those daily phone calls to and from headquarters DLA and DESCOM. Finally, I went to a shrink, and I was diagnosed as having a severe case of depoplexia. That's a medical term for DOD industrial complex withdrawal. Any cure? Well, we can only hope. 27 other former depot commanders are here in therapy with me. Well, good luck, sir, and, and thanks a lot. We now return you to your regular live instruction. Thanks a lot. Good morning, Agent T. Recent inspections indicate DOD storage practices leave much to be desired. Poor storage management has led to material deterioration, loss through pilferage, corrosion, and other severe mishaps which equate to hard-earned tax dollars. Congress is infuriated at this state of affairs and has vowed to disapprove any requests for new storage facility construction until DOD improves management of current facilities. So far, they have stayed true to their promise and have not released any dollars for this purpose. Recently, six DOD employees were severely injured when congressional aides physically removed them from a committee meeting and threw them down the 150 plus stairs leading to the Capitol entrance. Fortunately, traffic was light that day. We have been lucky so far that no major catastrophes or major security losses have occurred as a result of our storage management practices. The Secretary has decided this situation has gone far enough. Your mission, and you have decided to accept it, is to instruct members of the DOD logistics community in proper storage management techniques. As usual, if you or any of your co-workers in the Depot Supply Operations Management Committee are unsuccessful, the Secretary will disavow any knowledge of your existence, contract out your function, and reassign you all to remote locations throughout the world. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck, Agent T.
Good afternoon again, and welcome. Dear Mom, after flying all night, I arrived in Saigon amid one of the tremendous tropical downpours that I've heard so much about. You know, some of the fellas in OCS had told me about these storms, but you haven't really seen rain until you see this stuff. My first casualties of this conflict were my duffel bag and green uniform, which were both soaked by the time I ran the 200 yards from the plane to the hangar. The soil here is so soft that everything kind of sinks in place, including you if you stand still too long. With weather like this, I wonder how anyone could keep anything dry and usable. Vietnam amazes me at this point. There appears to be a lot of confusion and turmoil, but other than that, it looks just like your typical Southeast Asian country under siege, smile. Maybe I've read too many books and seen too many John Wayne movies because I expected to have to bail out over the drop zone and hit the ground firing my submachine gun. Instead, our flight landed, taxied, and did all the things normally associated with a civilized arrival. Before I tell you about my job, let me tell you about this one guy in my unit. His name is John Rambo, and he's a real wild guy. He mumbles a lot and carries a wide assortment of weird weapons but folks say he is really awesome out in the bush. Everyone in the unit has copied the way he dresses, and so I hope you aren't shocked at the picture and clothes. That's just the way we do things here. About my job. Despite all the good training I had at the infantry school, the ranger school, and airborne school, I have been assigned as the receiving officer for the Saigon area of Vietnam. I'm responsible for receiving the majority of Army material that comes into the port, signing for it, and storing it until either I can deliver it to the unit who ordered it, or they can come pick it up. At first, I was pretty upset that I wouldn't be working in my infantry specialty, but then Rambo told me that it was a good job with low stress and little chance of mortar shells falling around you. I have four people working directly for me and a detachment of 10 trucks assigned for the delivery mission. Now this all sounds nice and it appears I should be thankful and kicking back, but such is not the case. The job has gotten so bad that I'm thinking of requesting field duty just to get away from the stress and battle fatigue I face on a daily basis. I know, you're probably saying, why is this fool complaining? Well, first of all, Ma, I only have two very small Quonset huts for my inside warehouse storage space. One of them includes my office. Secondly, I've got an area about the size of one football field for my outside storage area. That's it. That's all the space I have for all the stuff arriving for the Army in Saigon. I'm not supposed to be into long-term storage. I'm only the process point, and then stuff is supposed to move to the depot at Cameron or to a unit. But mama, at least three times a day, every day, every single day, I get the following message from a truck driver or several truck drivers. Sir, I have a shipment for you on my truck. I really can't tell what it is, who ordered it, or how long ago it was ordered, but it's addressed to you as a receiving officer for Saigon. And then, Ma, they proceed to unload or dump this stuff on the ground in front of my already full storage hut. The last two weekends, I got the following message. Sir, I have a truckload of material for you. There are six more trucks coming in from the port, and sir, you should see the number of ships pu pulling into the harbor today. I understand all four ships have stuff on them for you, and two more ships are due in on Monday. Ma, I couldn't believe it, so I went down to the port, and sure enough, it was true. I was so stressed out that I wanted to pay someone to take the stuff out in the ocean and dump it. I ran out of open storage four weeks ago, and so the stuff I'm getting is just being piled up and rained on and sinking into the mud and muck. I even opened up an area called the beach, where if a unit needs something and they can find it and identify it, they can have it. No paperwork, no questions asked. 
My commander says the Army is now retrograding some of this stuff to Thailand, the Philippines, and Okinawa, just so they can identify it. It seems that someone in the States is really into pushing material into Vietnam, and we here have no visibility of what's coming or who it's for. My, if I come back with a Purple Heart, it'll be due to boxes and crates falling on me. This is a real mess. It really makes me wonder who the real enemy is, the Viet Cong or the Army supply system. Well, Ma, got to go. More material coming in. Say hello to everybody for me. Your son, the Beaver. You ever wish things could run just a little bit more smoothly? <laughs> you want how many batteries by when? <laughs> like you could depend on getting what you want when you want it. Yes, yes, I know. The light bulbs with the modular furniture, they'll be here, I think, in 30 days. I kind of like the dark myself. Everybody's talking about spending and budget cuts, and local purchasing isn't the way to be thrifty. So you're saying it cost us $20 per order if we local purchase? Well, that's the way we've been doing things for years, so I don't think we need to change now, do you? Listen, hey, could you cut the music down for a minute? Thanks. What if I told you that you could get certain supply items faster, cheaper, and fresher? I'd say, I think you're lying through your teeth. Seriously, there is a way to get certain supply items faster, cheaper, and fresher. <laughs> what kind of items are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I'd say things like film and batteries and light bulbs, you know, commercial items. Light bulbs? Delivered to you in just a couple of weeks. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? Pops. Pops? <laughs> Come on, it's another one of those acronyms. Pops show up for a paperless order placement system. When ordered from DGSC, these products will, in most instances, be delivered directly from the producer's commercial inventory. This is too much. What do you mean, deliver from the producer's commercial inventory? What do you mean? Kodak delivers straight to me? That's the idea. Here, let me show you something. This is the way, the traditional way things are done when you requisition. A key word, by the way, when you requisition items from the Defense Supply Center. Let's say uh, this is you. You're the customer. You're the guy that's got to do all the paperwork, right? You're the one that needs the supplies. So you fill out that requisition either on mill strip or fed strip and submit it electronically through audit or other electronic means or possibly even by mail to the Defense General Supply Center. Now, DGSC's got contracts out with vendors who keep the depot stocked. Now, let's take a closer look at this. Hey, how about getting an overhead shot of this? Great. Okay, here you are, the customer. You requisition to DGSC. DGSC pulls your order from the depot and ships it out to you. Meanwhile, DGSC is also maintaining its relationship with the vendors, trying to keep the depot filled. Now, this eats up time and energy. Yeah, but it's the system. It's what we're used to. It works. Yeah, it does. Well, matter of fact, it works real well, but it has its limitations. DGSC has got to keep the depot stocked and the government is still responsible for shipping the items to you, which means the government's got to fork out a big surcharge for just dealing with the risk of shipment. But what if we took away this side of the picture? You take away some of those sticks. Exactly. 
And that's what Pops is all about. It takes away some of the sticks. You're still the customer. You're still requisitioning like you always do on mill strip or fed strip and submitting that electronically to DGSC. And DGSC still maintains the relationship with the vendor. The difference is that now the vendor is responsible for sending the shipment straight to you. And that cuts down on costs and time. So the vendor ships the supplies straight to us. That makes real good sense. I mean, I think about something that's just come up here. I was informed the other day that we've got night maneuvers coming up in two weeks. They're going to be using batteries, a lot of batteries. Now, up to today, I was thinking I've got no choice. I've got to go local purchase. I mean, I usually think of requisitioning as an involved process, and that takes time. But what you're saying is that with this new way of doing things, pops. I can actually save time and money and even get my batteries here in a couple of weeks? That's right. There's no need to try to skirt around the process by opting for local purchasing. This new wholesale system, Pops, can meet your needs. I bet if you gave it a try, you'll see how it usually beats going through base procurement. Now, granted, some items are authorized for local purchase, and that shouldn't change. <laughs> but in your case, when you've got two weeks to get those batteries, I'd opt for Pops. All right. Well, tell me how to do it. OK, but you got to remember things really haven't changed that much. You still have to submit your requisition on mill strip or fed strip. The only difference is now you'll need one of these. And you'll need one. And you might as well have one, too. Don't you just love television? Hey, but I know. I know what you're thinking. How do I get one of these pop catalogs? Don't worry. I promise you'll find out. OK, now you see how the catalog is divided into white and green pages? The white section lists the items by national stock number, or NSN. The green section catalogs by vendors and vendors' catalog number. You use whatever's easiest for you. Everybody got that? Yeah. We got it. OK. Wait a minute. The gentleman who needs the batteries, what's your name? Bob. OK, Bob. Now, the type of battery you need for those flashlights is stock number 6140-01-203-4910. That's found on page two. You see the headings at the top of the page? You've got the vendor abbreviation, followed by the NSN. Then you've got the vendor's catalog number. Then the standard unit of issue, the minimum order quantity, the multiple order quantity, and then a description of the item. Now, let's take a look at your battery. The standard unit of issue is package. The minimum order quantity is 18. That's important. That's real important, because if you want your requisition to go through POPs, then you've got to order at least the minimum quantity as listed in the catalog. But what if you don't need that many? What if you only need half of that? Hang on, hang on. I'll answer that in a minute. Let's just look at the catalog for the moment. Again, the minimum for the batteries is 18 packages. Now, the reason for the minimum requirement is pretty obvious. Since the vendor is going to be delivering the shipment to you, you got to make it worth its while, right? If you need more than the minimum, which in this case you probably do, then you need to order that in the multiples as listed on the page. You can order the minimum plus any number times the multiple order quantity. In other words, that's your minimum plus any number x times the multiple. So back to our example. The minimum is 18, and the multiple is 6. Since you need more than 18 batteries, the next larger amount you can order is 24, right? The minimum is 18 plus any number, in this case 1, times the multiple which is 6, equals 24. If you need more, you can order 24, 30, 36, and so on. I understand I can order more than the minimum as long as I order them in the multiples as found in the catalog. Right. Minimums and multiples are, like I said before, real important because they act kind of like tags. They say to the computer, whoa, this is a pop item. When you fill out your mill strip or fed strip, 
there are four things to remember. One, make sure that stock number is correct. Two, there's no need for any sort of advice code or exception data. If you put that in, you'll kick it out of the system. Three, you'll need correct minimum and multiples as found in your POPs catalog. And four, you'll need the correct unit of issue. Whew. All right, I'll take your questions now. What if I want an amount that's more than the minimum, but less than the required multiples? In other words, I want something in the middle. Good question. The minimum amount will be handled by POPs and round it up to the next multiple if there isn't much difference. Otherwise, the quantity will be rounded down and you'll be advised of that status. Now, of course, the depot will still be filling requisition quantities for less than the POPs minimum. You know, while there are a lot of items on POPs like respirators and film and developers and, and batteries and light bulbs and lamps, it's still relatively new. The defense supply system is working to establish other relationships with other vendors for other products. As a matter of fact, there are new items being added to POPs all the time. And the best way to find out what's currently being offered is to check the DGSC electronic bulletin board for the POPs file. In the meantime, remember, for those items that aren't listed as POPs, or for those items that you just can't justify ordering the minimum requirement, the traditional logistics system is still available. Well, that answers my question. In other words, if you can't order the minimum quantity, then the Defense Supply Center will take care of the order through the depot, even if it is a POPs item. One more question. Do I still have to send in a D6S? Yes. That helps us keep our records. If you're not sure about how you fill it out, check the mill strap under the D6S reference. Sometimes they're automatic. Check your system. Remember, at this point, POPs is an alternative, a great alternative. If you can get your needs to match up with the catalog, you're going to get your supplies faster, cheaper, and fresher. There's no doubt about it. I think it's great. I can please more people and I don't have to deal with the hassle that goes with procurement. I'll certainly order my batteries through POPs. I'd be a fool not to. Plus, because of the efficiency of POPs, I can reduce my stock levels so there's less invested in inventory. They say they can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, let's just say I'm learning. What impresses me most about this is that with POPs, we have the potential to improve our readiness through supply. What more could we ask for? A three-day pass. Requisition pops. It's simple. And hey, if you can do me another favor, tell all the folks about it. They're going to want to know. I guarantee you. Who are you talking to? Oh, nobody. Well, I just want you to know, I really appreciate the work you've been doing. Well, thanks. But you know, this new inventory system, Just-In-Time Inventory, pops another acronym. It's really made the difference. Have I told you about it? Well, what we do... Tell them what time to come. They don't ever get here on time. Where's Bucky? 
That guy had been here on time since he was four years old. Didn't he know what time it is? Oh, I'm actually with you now.